In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Almighty God, you have revealed to your church your eternal being and glorious majesty and perfect love as one God and trinity of persons. Give us grace that, like your Bishop Gregory of Nazianzus, we may continue steadfast in the confession of this faith and constant in our worship of you, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. For you live and reign forever and ever. Amen. My name is Father Robert Anthony Rhodes. I'm one of the founders, one of the co-founders of the Community of Mary, Mother of the Redeemer. And today is the feast day of Gregory of Nazianzus. And one of the readings that we receive from the church today is this one from the 8th chapter of the Gospel of John. They said to Jesus, Who are you? Jesus said to them, Why do I speak to you at all? I have much to say about you and much to condemn, but the one who sent me is true. And I declare to the world what I have heard from him. They did not understand what he was that he was speaking to them about the Father. So Jesus said, When you have lifted up the Son of Man, then you will realize that I am he, and that I do nothing on my own, but I speak these things as the Father instructed me. And the one who sent me is with me. He has not left me alone, for I always do what is pleasing to him. As he was saying these things, many believed in him. Then Jesus said to the Jews who had believed in him, If you continue in my word, you are truly my disciples, and you will know the truth, and the truth will make you free. Today is the feast day of Gregory of Nazianzus, an important bishop of the church, important writer of the church, important theologian of the church, in fact, um, One of the names uh, that he's given is Gregory the Theologian. He is, uh, along with Basil the Great, who was a great friend of his for many years, and Basil's brother Gregory of Nyssa, um, he and they are known as the Cappadocian Fathers. Uh, What um, in some seminaries has been called the Cap Daddies. Uh, These are uh, three folks who did a lot of work on hammering out uh, the theology of the Trinity, um, especially in that sort of, uh, in that time when, um, what that meant, uh, what that theology was, uh, that when um, orthodoxy as we understand it wasn't completely hammered out. Uh, Basil and Gregory knew each other for a long time. They went to school together um, in a couple of different places and uh, One of their um, classmates was Julian, who would feature later in their life. We're talking, uh, by the way, in the 4th century. Um, Gregory was born in 330, just to give you an idea of the time. Uh, Not only did Gregory and Basil go to school together, um, do theology together, they worked on projects together. They they, uh, compiled some of Origen's works. Um, They tried to live a monastic life together for a while. Uh, Both of them um, really had at least uh, several bones of monastic vocation in their bodies, Uh, and I think maybe Gregory even more than Basil in some ways. Uh, Gregory wanted to stay um, in that kind of life, uh, living a monastic life, writing, compiling theology. He was also a poet. He liked to write poetry. Uh, but at some point, Gregory's father, who was a bishop, actually, interestingly, the bishop of Nazianzus, um, his father's name is also Gregory, so there are, in a way, um, two people named Gregory of Nazianzus. Uh, Gregory's father uh, called him home to be ordained. He needed him. There were some issues around um, disputes about the faith, and he knew that Gregory was thoughtful um, and spoke well and wrote well, and so he called him home despite Gregory's um, protests against that. 
ordained him um, as a priest in that diocese, uh, and Gregory helped his father um, work out those disputes with the people around him. Um, this wasn't something Gregory wanted. Um, he called this um, this uh, forced ordination a kind of tyranny. He was not happy about being ordained. He just wanted to be a, a simple monk. Um, it took uh, his friend, his good friend Basil, uh, to get him to actually go back and spend some time with his father and help his father work that out. But as soon as he could, he went back to uh, monastic life, uh, to writing poetry and to working on theology and to praying. He loved to pray. That was his ordination to priesthood was 361. Um, but in the meantime, before that ordination, uh, his classmate from when he was younger, Julian, had actually become emperor uh, and also had rejected Christianity. So he's the one that is called Julian the Apostate, and he became known for persecuting the church. Gregory uh, responded by writing works uh, in protest against Julian's persecutions, but he did it in a way that was probably not expected by people in power at the time. What Gregory wrote was that the way ultimately Julian and other emperors like him would be overcome uh, would be through love and patience, and ultimately the internal transformation of the people of the church, a process called theosis, which is very well known in the Eastern Church, was very well known all across the church at the time. Um, the idea being that in prayer, uh, in deep prayer and deep spiritual practice, uh, people become more and more godlike. That's theosis. Divinization is another word for this. Um, and that as the church became more divinized, as the church um, entered more and more into this process of theosis, uh, empire would lose its power over them. However, uh, Gregory um, talked about this. Julian didn't want to hear it at all and kind of went after Gregory more or less directly. Uh, but luckily for Gregory, uh, Julian died um, a year after that work that he had written um, came out, uh, 362. And so Julian died in 363. And the new emperor who took over was friendlier to Christians. Um, and Gregory didn't have to worry about that so much. Uh, at some point, Gregory's friend Basil himself became a bishop and called on Gregory um, to serve also as a bishop, to be ordained as a bishop, uh, the Bishop of Sasima. And so Gregory, again, wanted nothing to do with this. Uh, but Basil um, worked overtime to talk him into it. Um, he, he he needed him for um, reasons having to do with politics and the church. He needed him to be a bishop. So Gregory uh, was consecrated a bishop in 371. And uh, as you might guess, he hated it. I mean, he hated it. Again, he's more he's a he's a poet. He's a contemplative. He's a mystic. He's a theologian. Um, he has a, a deeply monastic. Um, spiritual life. He just wanted to be a monk. And it was bad enough that his father had made him be ordained a priest. So a, a bishop is just, you know, exponentially uh, more um, dug into the, the political life of the church and, frankly, um, the political life of the world. Uh, and this strained his relationship with Basil in pretty serious ways. Even so, he served um, in that capacity uh, as long as he could. But there was a point at which um, his parents had died, his family um, were kind of dying, and he was getting older. And even his friend Basil, who had originally sort of pushed him into episcopacy, uh, died. And so he left the diocese to take some time to heal. And he went back to monastic life, going to the monastery of St. Thecla in Seleucia. So he stayed there for a while and recovered. Um, at some point, he moved to Constantinople and opened a little um, chapel there uh, where he preached and wrote and taught. Um, he was obviously, um, you know, once a bishop, always a bishop. Uh, but he, he 
did that work in this little small chapel because the official bishop of Constantinople was at the time an Arian Christian. And, uh, and part of what Gregory was trying to do um, was promote uh, Trinitarian and Christological orthodoxy. So he wrote, um, as I said, he wrote a lot of poetry, he kept writing poetry through this time, but he also wrote and preached about, he had five big important sermons on the Trinity and other works on, uh, on the Trinity. And he began to influence the people um, in the church and in the world around him about the truth of Trinitarian orthodoxy against the Arians who were in charge, and ultimately an emperor, Theodosius, uh, got rid of uh, the Arian bishop of Constantinople and that part of the church that agreed with him. And then uh, at that point, uh, you know, there's a story about Gregory being in Hagia Sophia and the and sunlight coming through one of the windows and landing on him, and that's when the people acclaimed him. Um, Bishop of Constantinople. I, I don't know if that's um, uh, what the historicity of that truth is, but Theodosius wanted him to be bishop. The people wanted him to be a bishop, so he became a bishop of, Constant, of Constantinople. And he stuck around for the council that was held there. Um, but as soon as it was over, he it must have worn him out. Um, he went back uh, to Nazianzus, kind of retired there. And ultimately, he died in 389. I think about what it means for someone who uh, is a person of um, contemplative spirit, monastic spirit, uh, to be called into the active life of a church. I think about what it means uh, for someone like that to be called into that life and accept a call, even when that person really doesn't want it and you know once a funny word right I mean there are lots of things that we want and don't want that are about our um, you know our sort of personal uh, weaknesses or preferences and they kind of don't matter and maybe we should give them up but there are some things that we desire uh, that we desire for a reason. Um, I don't mean a practical reason, although that may be true, um, but that the desire we have for them is implanted in us by God. And that uh, when that desire is denied, we become, um, it has a cost. Uh, and, and I think about that with Gregory's life because he so clearly just wanted to spend his time as a monk and a theologian. Uh, and it seems pretty clear that he was he was called to that. But every time someone called him, when his father called him, when, when Basil called him, um, when Theodosius called him, and the people of Constantinople called him, and he said yes, it was because he thought he should. I think it's because he thought God called him even though he did not want it and did not um, like it and did not thrive. He did good work, but he didn't thrive. Uh, uh, personally, it, it cost him. It cost him in deep ways. I, I don't think we can ever know what the truth of Gregory's call was. I know the church would be less, um, it seems like, if he didn't accept those calls. Uh, his work on theosis is really important. Um, and obviously, the work around the Trinity is very important. Um, even his work in, uh, in in a quiet and subtle way, just setting up that little chapel and and teaching in small groups to people uh, about the Trinity, um, that mattered. Uh, so maybe God would have worked that out some other way, or maybe it needed to be Gregory. I, I don't know. We don't know what his call is. Um, because the other possibility is that God wanted him to be a monk and a contemplative. So we don't know whether God was calling him to be that, calling him to be a monk, or calling him to be a bishop. Um, and the pious answer might be that he became a bishop and he did all these things you know, for the church, and that even if it cost him, that sacrifice. Um, maybe that's what we should expect. So that's one way to look at it. But I don't think we should assume that. 
that Gregory as bishop rather than monk is what God wanted. I think the only thing we can know is that whatever uh, decision Gregory made based on his felt call, um, his internal uh, sense of call, but also the call of the church around him and the world around him, uh, whatever decisions he made based on those sense of that sense of call, those various senses of calling and his gifts. God found a way to use it, um, and that that's uh, a thing that God does all the time. And so, not that there can't sometimes be tragedy in what seems like a missed call, but it might be good for us to find a way um, to trust that whatever decision we make, we don't need to fear, um, that God is going to use that in some way, as long as it manifests gifts that we have, it gives us an opportunity to use the gifts that God has given us, that God will find a way to use that um, for the church, for the church's ministry, and ultimately um, for the reconciliation and recreation of the whole world. St. Gregory of Nazianzus, for those who struggle with callings that are painful for them and those who uh, have the courage to follow a call that the rest of the world may not see please pray for us amen <laughs>